And so that brings us to our last question, which is from Francois. And he asks, if we observe the feasts of the Lord, how should we Christians practically celebrate or participate in the festival of unleavened bread, specifically the first and the seventh day, which are meant to be holy convocations to the Lord, as we are not Jews? So it's a little bit of an involved question, but um, yeah. I know that you'll have something good for us from God's word. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you for your question, Francois. Um, it is a lot of details, but I appreciate the details because it helps understand kind of more of your thinking and where you're coming from. So before I directly answer your question, I want to speak about the premise that it seems to be based on. So I don't know this, but from your question, it seems like you believe that we are still required to observe the Feast of the Lord. And that's actually biblically not true. Um, so I'm going to briefly explain why that is. So we'll use the example that you did of the festival of the unleavened bread. So the feast or the festival of the unleavened bread was closely related to Passover. And just a few details about it are, um, had to be done in Jerusalem, had to be done in the sanctuary, had to be done on the right day. It was tied to Israelite agriculture. It was restricted to genetic Jews. And you probably knew those things, which is where your question came from. Like if all these things are requirements, then how in the world are we supposed to do this? And another key aspect of this festival and the, all the feasts of the Lord, they were dependent upon the sanctuary, which was the place where we had the, sac the sacrifices, which, is, which was required before Jesus died for our sins. So you had to sacrifice certain animals and do certain things with its blood. And it was very, very involved in the sanctuary of God. But when Jesus came and died for us, he was the perfect sacrifice. And Hebrews 9 and 10 especially talks about this, that Jesus died once for all, and no one, there's no more need for any sacrifices. That Jesus was the fulfillment of a shadow of things to come, it says in Colossians. That he was perfect for an imperfect system. And it goes on and on and on about this. And even Hebrews 10, 4, the author admits, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So all of these feasts and these festivals were pointing towards the Messiah of we're doing these sacrifices because Jesus is going to come. Well, they didn't know Jesus' name, but the Messiah is going to come and we're pointing towards the Messiah. We can't wait for the Messiah. And then the Messiah came and Jesus took care of all the sacrifices and he was the fulfillment of all of these patterns and all of these parables. So now that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those things, your question can be rephrased as almost how can we celebrate something that has already been fulfilled? So it's not as, it doesn't really exist anymore because, well, how can we, and your, your question kind of points to that. How can we celebrate this when it's been fulfilled? So going to your original question, let's say you still want to celebrate this festival, not because it's salvific, because it's not, but because you just want to, it's just something you want to do. How to celebrate that is a difficult question because you kind of have to recreate the whole festival in your own way. We don't, we're not going to go to Jerusalem, okay? And we don't need sacrifices anymore, okay? We don't have sanctuary. We're not waiting for the Messiah's first coming. So what are we, what are we supposed to do? It's, it's like you have to recreate and man make the festival from the ground up. And then what's the point? Because it's no longer from God, it's from our own imaginations. So there are ways that we can have a memorial for what Jesus has done for us, and there's ways we can celebrate it, but it's no longer what we find in these festivals because Jesus has fulfilled all of it. My best suggestion in this kind of case would actually be to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, when Jesus gave, his, um, gave the fruit of the vine as a symbol of his blood and gave bread as a symbol of his body, this is one of the most beautiful ways we can have a memorial for what Jesus has done for us. And this is what we can do as Christians, not trying to recreate, but something that Jesus has already given us to remember him until we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper with him again in heaven. Amen. Very good. And uh, just to add on to that, you know, the, it specifically says in the Old Testament that the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread was an ordinance, uh, mm -hmm. not like the Ten Commandments. It was an ordinance. And we know from Colossians 2.14 that the ordinances handwritten by Moses, not the Ten Commandments, but those handwritten ordinances were nailed to the cross. And so um, just like yeah. you're saying, we really need to 
know God's word in the whole context and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, think about these things practically and thank God that he gives us all of his truth and he gives us wisdom to, um, to think about these things. So we are so grateful to Callie for you coming on today and helping us understand God's word better and for answering these questions. And we are so grateful that you guys are listening to us. If you guys have a question you want answered, feel free to come on to our website at bibleask.org forward slash ask and uh, ask your question and just make sure you press yes. You would like it answered here on the show. So we uh, look forward to hearing from you all and hearing more questions. Thanks again, guys. God bless.